Okay, so uh, we'll start uh, the second lecture. So I, in this lecture, I first I'll discuss some uh, general features of uh, quantum chaos. Um, I mean, quantum chaos is a very large subject, and people have been working on this uh, for a long time. And a lot of the of the work centers on the discussion of the spectrum of the Hamiltonian, and they look at chaos through looking at the spectrum. Um, this uh, discussion will will follow some work that was done by Schenker and Stanford and also Kitayev that and also other people like um, Daniel Roberts and Saskin and others. And this um, focuses on uh, what happens with the operators and how operators evolve and um, and they basically follow the initial development. It's relevant for the initial development of uh, chaos, as I will discuss in a moment. Um, now, um, okay. So we'll um, we mentioned uh, briefly last time that uh, in the particular case of SYK, if we evolve an operator, right? So when we evolve an operator in time, we're just evolving it according to its uh, Heisenberg equation of motion. Um, and infinitesimally, what that means is we commute with the Hamiltonian. And then if we want to evolve further, we commute again with the Hamiltonian and so on. So successive commutation with the Hamiltonian will evolve the field in time. Right? And so we're just trying to see what happens with an operator. Um, so we're going to separate the operators into, well, we have simple operators, which will contain, let's say, one insertion of the fermion field, and more complicated operators, which will contain many insertions of the fermion field. Um, so in the SYK case, for example, this gave us something which involved uh, three, three fermions. And then uh, we can do it again, and we mentioned that, uh, well, it could act on any of these three fermions, and we get start getting more and more complicated. Uh, operators of this form. So something that we see is that here in this this particular system, as we uh, agree the Hamiltonian, we uh, have um, the, the the operator starts uh, growing. Uh, okay, so that's a first observation. And second uh, second point is the following. So imagine that you had uh, an operator. So you, you had two operators which initially commute with each other. So let's say psi 1 and psi 2, for example. So this uh, initially anti-commute with each other. Okay. I mean, this whole discussion can be done either with bosonic or fermionic operators. So you just change commutator with anti-commutator, so it's the same, uh, the same discussion. So this could have been, let's say, we could have had a spin chain and we could be discussing what happens with when the Hamiltonian acts with a, on a Pauli spin one of the qubit operators and how it generates more complicated qubit operators. Okay. Um, so uh, so we can have, uh, so initially this commutator is zero. And so now we can start evolving the operators. So this, of course, is what we get by acting with the Heisenberg equation of motion on the first, on the operators that equal to zero. And what we see is that when we act it on, for example, psi 1, we here will generate more and more other operators. We generate the superposition of other operators. And in general, these operators might or might not contain psi 2. Okay. Um, and well, initially, we might get a little bit of psi 2, so this will be slightly non-zero. Right? And here, we'll get more and more operators, so the chances that we'll get psi 2 in this sum uh, or in this combination of operators, because the operator is the product of many psi's, the chance that the term here will contain psi 2 grows. Okay. So uh, this commutator uh, will start growing, or this anti-commutator will start growing. But, but it's a little hard to, uh, so the commutator, of course, is an operator. So when we say it grows, it's a little uh, unclear exactly what we mean, right? So, well, um, it means that if we took the norm of this operator, the operator norm will be growing. So that's one 
uh, sense in which it is growing. Right? So, um, so we could take, for example, the trace of the square of the commutator. That would be one way to assess this uh, norm and the growth of the operator. Um, another possibility would be to take uh, to take the square of the operator and then take the expectation value in some state. Uh, that's a slightly different notion. Um, so, for example, and we'll follow the second notion. So we'll take, uh, let's say, two different operators, psi 1 of t and uh, psi 2 of 0, um, that were initially commuting. We will take uh, their square and then take the expectation value, let's say, on a thermal state. So this will be the thermal uh, expectation value. If we set uh, beta equal to 0, we would, be, we would be taking just the trace of... Uh, of this square, right? That would be one notion of the norm of uh, the operator, norm square of the operator, okay. the L2 norm. Um, okay, so, but if beta is non-zero, we are in some sense regulating that norm, so we are, we are looking at uh, how this operator looks on acting on low energy states, on the states of typical temperature beta. Right? So we are uh, making a kind of truncation on, um, on the, on the states, and so we are computing um, how, so when this Hamiltonian acts and we generate a high energy state, acting on the vacuum, that will give a very small, uh, acting on a thermal state of temperature beta, if it is a very high energy state, will give a very small contribution. Okay, um, okay so uh, what we expect uh, is um, that as a function of time, uh, this uh, commutator starts uh, being very small, right? Um, but this uh, is growing. Now, um, when we uh, calculate, the, so to, to lead in order in the large n expansion, um, these uh, these operators um, are well. These operators are sort of one of these operators that factorize in the large n expansion, so they have uh, correlators which go like one over n. So the correlation functions. Yeah, go like 1 over n. Yes. Yeah, I mean time commutator. Yes, sorry. Yeah, this can be done both for uh, bosonic or fermionic operators, and we are taking the notion here that is appropriate to the um, it's appropriate to the statistics of the field. So, um, yeah. So that's uh, so it's this uh, anti commutator therefore will be small. Um, and will be of order one over n. So the this um, so I mean this could be done even in a planar theory, for example, a matrix theory. And then these operators would be let's say single trace operators, uh, and then the correlators would go like one over n. So this is some growing thing, but whose coefficient is uh, one over n. Okay. Um, okay. So. Um, but uh, here, the, the number of different operators that we can get here uh, grows uh, pretty rapidly because once uh, we start doing commutators, the commutators can act on any of this uh, field, and um, they very quickly generate uh, the most, uh, the very general operator in Hilbert space. And so the growth here is uh, exponential, so with some power, which uh, it's uh, we don't know. We would, in principle, need to cut know the Hamiltonian to figure out what this power is. And eventually, this com and this uh, commutator cannot be become too big because this uh, where uh, operators who squared uh, is one, right, or one half. Uh, and um, so, for example, if we yeah, so this uh, commutator is bounded above, right, by some number of order one, maybe two or four, or whatever. Uh, so I'm going to call that one. Uh, so it eventually will uh, saturate at uh, a big value of order one. We'll let that be a little more precise. And this saturation point happens when this whole um, this whole expression becomes of order one. That's one way to estimate where this point is. And this is uh, this time here is sometimes called t star or the scrambling time. So at this time, the um, 
this operator here has become uh, so complicated uh, that uh, the anti-commutator with any simple operator uh, will be of order one. Okay. So it's somehow the effects of this operator have spread through throughout the system. Okay, so this uh, is, uh, so we'll discuss that a little bit more, but first let me uh, discuss a classical analog of this, uh, so classical physics, but maybe we could just do it in this blackboard. Um, well, let's not mess it. So in classical physics, we normally say that uh, we have a trajectory, um, so with some initial condition, uh, Q given by some Q0 and P0, uh, some initial condition, and will get us to some, uh, some, some Qs and Ps at late time. Now, if we vary the initial position slightly, uh, we will get to some other position at time t, right, that will have some difference. And so, if we have some small change in the initial condition, let's say some small change in the value of uh, Q0, um, then uh, we can calculate uh, these changes here by, so we'll have, for example, there will be some change at late time in, uh, let's say, in delta Q of t, uh, that, uh, so we could calculate um, that change will be some kind of derivative of delta Q of t with respect to the initial condition, right? And this is nothing else but the Poisson bracket of uh, Q of t with uh, P of zero. So we see that the change is commu computed by the Poisson bracket, and the Poisson bracket is the classical analog of the commutator. So the growth of uh, these commutators is uh, the quantum version of the growth of the uh, perturbations that we have at time t due to a change in the initial condition at the initial time. Okay. And in a classical system, uh, we initially have these diversions, uh, this, this change in the initial conditions, but eventually, uh, so if we have some bounded system, so we, let's say at some time t we are here, um, if we start changing the initial condition, we'll be at some other time, uh, at some other location. But since this distance is growing, at some point, uh, this approximation uh, of taking the, uh, this calculating this change by a simple derivative will not work anymore, right? This is a growing effect, and at some point, this linearized approximation will not work. Um, and the, at that point, the, if the Q, if Q series here, after you did the change, it might be anywhere else, right? So that, uh, that point where uh, the linear approximation doesn't work and the second trajectory is basically anywhere in phase space is analogous to uh, this uh, saturation here where uh, we, um, okay, where things do not continue growing anymore. Um, good. Um, so that's the classical analog. Now let me make here just a simple trivial comment. So sometimes people say that there is no uh, chaos in quantum mechanics because the Schrodinger equation is linear. Okay. Um, now that, that that is true. So the distance between two wave functions will remain constant, will not grow exponentially. But I think, uh, but. On the other hand, the classical analog of the Schrodinger equation should be the Liouville equation, for example, uh, that describes how probability uh, distribution in phase space changes. And that's also linear. So also with the same criterion, you would say that there is no, um, no classical chaos. But the classical chaos is in the, in the observables themselves, in, the, um, in these functions q of t and so on. And uh, in the quantum case, it's in the algebra of operators. So we see that the operator algebra gets more complicated. Yeah. What about the distance uh, Well, the, again, the, 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 the equation is, uh, is linear, right? So the equation that uh, describes the evolution of the density matrix is linear. I should have, uh, yeah, so that's the more directly analogous to the Liouville equation. So maybe I should have put that sentence in the middle. So if we go to the density matrix and then the equation for density matrix is linear also. Um, okay, good. So now we'll uh, continue discussing this committee and we'll, we'll make uh, one point. Um, so we'll have, uh, yeah, I'm here changing between commutators and anti-commutators. I'm sorry about this. Well, maybe it just shows you that the discussion is general, right? So <laughs> irrelevant. <laughs> 
<laughs> the thing is, I, I, I mixed the notation, so I, well, let, 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 me, let me try to keep the anti-commutators. I'll get some of the signs wrong in what I'm going to say now. But, um, well, let me, just to be a little more clear, instead of considering the index uh, psi 1 and psi 2, let me consider operators V and W. Okay. So let me call this W and this V. Okay. Um, they are fermionic emission operators. Um, so we have that uh, anti-commutator, and uh, we are going to expand it, and so it has uh, various terms. So one of the terms uh, has the form uh, V of 0, W of T squared, uh, V of 0, right? So that's one of the terms. And then another term uh, has uh, the form W of T, V of 0, W of T, V of 0. And then there are two other terms. There are four terms in total, right? Um, now, uh, so there are two terms are roughly the adjoints of this. So, so here, this this term can be viewed as the norm of a state that is given by. So first we act with W of zero, then with W of t, and then we calculate the norm of that state, for example, as this interpretation. And in in this uh, interpretation, this this state is. Uh, what we would call um, it some correlator where the times are in a reasonable order, right? They can be, in order to measure this, you could just act with these two operators and then calculate the norm of the state, which uh, is something we could do. Right? Uh, it's not, um, it's an easy experiment. This one is a so-called out-of-time order correlator, where we first do an observation at zero, then at t, then we evolve the system backwards in time again and do this measurement at zero, and then uh, forwards in time again and do this measurement at t. This is not easy to compute. So you have to have good control on your Hamiltonian to be able to compute this. So this is a difficult calculation. Oh, now, yeah. Well, I, I, at this, at this, in these lines, I'm not assuming it, but I, I will assume it. Oh yes, yes. To say that, I, I did assume that. Um, um, okay, so uh, so that's the uh, point. Now, um, initially, the uh, so this this the, the square. Remember that these were simple fermionic operators. So the square of this operator. So if, if we did literally this model, the square of this operator is one, and the square of this one is also one. Um, so this whole thing would be one. Right? But initially, the initial thing was zero. So that means that this, this other thing would also be one. And it's one because these two things, uh, essentially, these two commute with each other and could uh, almost commute. So the point is that this initial correlator uh, starts essentially being one, or maybe it's minus one. Well, you know, uh, change signs. So starts being, uh, this will be minus, well, OK. I I'm here plotting minus that thing, so that minus that correlator. Uh, starts being 1, and then it will start decreasing. And this stays 1 for all time. So this is constant, and so the growth of that commutator comes from the decrease of this uh, correlator. Um, so it basically comes because this correlator starts decreasing. Okay, um, Okay. so that's uh, that. And so um, sometimes it's, easy, it's a little easier to think uh, in terms of uh, correlation functions rather than the, commu the computing direct commutator is completely equivalent as you ha just are seeing, uh, but we'll center a bit more the discussion on just calculating this out of time order correlator. Um, and it's a uh, decrease in time is related to uh, chaos and the, the, the growth of perturbations. This is sometimes called the quantum butterfly effect. So, um, OK, so in principle, if we were powerful enough to calculate that, we, uh, we can determine this uh, exponent. Um, and it turns out that uh, this uh, exponent uh, has, uh, let's say, some natural units, which um, are uh, in terms of the temperature. So um, OK, well, let me, let me just say. Uh, so in a weakly coupled, th in a free theory, so let's see, in a free theory, these two are different operators. We can always commute them, and there is no growth, and lambda is equal to zero. Okay. In a weakly coupled theory, then uh, lambda turns out to be uh, proportional to some kind of coupling constant, so some weak coupling constant. So it could be 
g squared, and then there will be something that gives the units. So that has mm -hmm. units of energy. Um, it, uh, in a scale invariant theory, would be just the temperature. Um, in other models, like the let's say SYK model that have um, have a, an energy scale, that lambda uh, is uh, is equal to j okay, at the weak coupling. Is it possible that lambda comes out negative? Um, um, no, I think I think it will. It no, it will always be positive. I mean, there might be. I mean, when you do the computation, there will be a kernel that you have. You have to diagonalize. It might have some eigenvalues which are negative, I but you, they will. The, the idea is that this lambda is the <laughs> largest eigenvalue. I thought some people looked at like Owen model or mm -hmm. Ah, okay, so it might be that the non-unitary theory or some uh, uh -huh. some funny. I mean, this uh, in in, in, in a physical theory, this should be positive. Yeah. And then in a very strongly coupled theory, very so very strongly coupled. Um, for example, uh, one example of a strongly coupled theory would be a theory that has a gravity dual. So I'll discuss that computation in detail in the next lecture. But you can do this computation by using a theory that has a gravity dual. The thermal background corresponds to, um, to a black hole. And by doing some computations near a black hole background, you uh, see that lambda is uh, equal to um, 2 pi times the temperature, okay? or 2 pi over beta, beta is the inverse temperature. So that's what you get in those cases. And then uh, it turns out that it is possible to prove a bound. Uh, so there is a so-called chaos bound, which uh, you can argue in general for systems that um, have uh, this notion of simple operators or some kind of large n uh, structure. So this is a very general argument uh, that says that lambda should be less or equal than this maximal value. Right? OK. And this is, so I, I didn't show you how to prove this. Um, so this was argued by um, by Stanford, Shankar, and myself. And the, um, the argument basically uses simple notions of analyticity and complex anal analyticity. Uh, so by taking the partition function, taking the correlator and analytically continuing it, uh, analytically continuing the time and uh, and then using simple analyticity properties, you can argue this formula. Um, yes? No, it do doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. It, it's, it's not. So maybe, yeah, perhaps I, I uh, it's not. So in fact, in the SYK model, you uh, find that the lambda will be some function, some generic function. So you can write it as, uh, let's say, t times uh, some generic function of uh, beta and j, right? So this was the dimensionless coupling that we had. And then for small, um, for small, well, for example, for small values, this is proportional to beta j, and we recovered this. And for very strong values, this f goes to 2 pi, and we recover the other formula. So, yeah. Yeah, so so the, the the assumptions are that uh, that this correlator um, stays uh, bounded and proportional, basic, so very close to the this two point function. Okay, um, that's uh, one assumption, uh, and the other is uh, this analyticity in the um, well, the, the just simple analyticity property that comes from the fact that in if you but by the simple expression of this in terms of Hamiltonian. So, so the, the non-trivial assumption is this one here. Um, okay. Yes, this is uh, for simple operators. I mean, if you have a very complicated operator, it doesn't uh, need to apply. I mean, you will not have the, the, the initially commute. Perhaps. Yeah.
Yes, yes. Yes, that's the idea. This is a bound on the biggest exponent, and indeed, uh, you there are some examples, uh, especially in integrable theories, where you can, uh, depending on the operator you choose, you can get uh, different exponents. Uh, but the expectation is that in a generic uh, theory that is not integrable, you basically will probe this. Uh, I mean, any operator will uh, have uh, this maximal exponent. Uh, no, not the maximal exponent. We will have. Uh, some contribution from the piece that has this uh, some this exponent lambda which has some function some some something you have to compute in your theory um, okay yeah I didn't also mention in also in conformal field theories this exponent is related to the uh, to the reg uh, well to the reg limit and to the spin appearing, the power appearing in the ratio limit. So maybe I'll, but I, I, I won't have time to, to explain that. So you can ask me in the question session if you want. Um, okay, so now um, we'll, okay, so that's a general chaos discussion. The objective of this discussion was uh, mainly to, um, to describe uh, this notion of chaos, the uh, fact that we are interested in out of time order correlation functions that expose this. Uh, this Lyapunov exponent, that definition, and then uh, mention that there is a bound on this. Good, so now we'll uh, go to, now we'll continue the discussion we had last time on the SYK model, and we'll analyze the SYK model at low temperatures. And let me say again uh, what low temperatures mean. So, the, there is a uh, Dimension full constant J, uh, um, and then we'll take temperatures which are uh, low temperatures means large beta. So this will be much larger than one. This was an effective coupling, so that means that we will be at uh, strong coupling. Um, but we we don't want it to be too strong because we we are going to at first do some analysis to lead in order in n. And in order for the large n expansion not to break down, we we'll want to make this less than n. Um, so, uh, in terms of the spectrum, so we said that the SYK model has some kind of uh, spectrum that roughly looks like this. It's not a semicircle; it's more complicated. Whatever. Uh, and um, and we are going to be focused. So this first condition focuses the attention on the spect on the energy levels in this region. But this uh, second constraint is saying that we have here a huge number of, of uh, levels. We have an exponentially large number of levels that are contributing. So we're not we're not focusing on the last uh, energy level here, on the smallest energy. We are having we are considering a bunch of low energy states. Uh, good. So uh, now uh, we'll uh, we'll I'll remind you of the equations we had last time. Um, there they are. Um, <laughs> so we had um, we had the effective action, the equations of motion coming from the effective action, and the the equation, the simpler simple form of the equation, which assumed the translation symmetry. So we're going to solve these equations in Euclidean time. Okay. Um, well, sorry. We're, we're first uh, we're first going to try to solve the, those two those equations, and. Uh, First, so these are equations we got in the large n limit, and first we're going to assume that beta is infinite, okay, so zero temperature. And we're going to uh, make uh, an approximation here. We're going to assume that we can neglect this term in the equation. And then we're going to, after we find the solution, neglecting this term, we're going to go back and check that we can neglect this term, okay? So we're going to make a scaling ansatz uh, for this equation and try to solve it. Um, so the simplified equation is sigma uh, g of omega equal to 1 and, uh, well, the second equation. So we're going to assume that g uh, is equal to 1 over t to the 2 delta, okay? And then uh, that implies that uh, sigma is uh, 1 over t to the 2 uh, delta times uh, Q minus 1, right? 
And in order to solve the first equation, we simply have to uh, do the Fourier transform of this. So Fourier transform of this, uh, this is a power law, so Fourier transform is another power law, which we determine by dimensional analysis. So this has this unit of time to the 2 delta, so we have a omega to the 2 delta here. Is that clear? And then there is an integral over time, so we have minus 1 here. Okay? It's clear, Fourier transform. Um, here we do the Fourier transform, same story, omega to the 2 delta q minus 1, minus 1, okay? And so this is sigma of omega, and this is g of omega. I'm neglecting the roll constant. You guys can, as an exercise, do it with a roll constant. Um, and uh, and then uh, we, are, we need to impose this equation. That means we need to multiply these two things and get 1, right? So the multiplication of these two things should be 1. And that tells us that omega, so that will contain a factor of omega to the 2 times uh, delta. And then there is a q minus 1 from here and a 1 from there. So delta q minus 1, OK? So this minus 1 comes from these two minus 1s. And in order for this to be 1, it means that uh, this thing should be 0. And that means that uh, delta is equal to q, OK? A 1 over q. And tell you, uh, I remind you what q was. So the SYK Hamiltonian has the right, right form j with a bunch of indices and psi to the q. Okay, so that's uh, what q is. So the original model I described yesterday was what q equal to 2. This psi to the q, it means that there are four powers of, there are q powers, q factors of psi with different indices. Yes? Um, mm, well, um, um, well, one one uh, one argument is uh, would be to say that uh, um, well, you you want that g there, so I, I first. Well, yeah, I don't want to give you a very mathematical argument. It's, it's something that it depends on your model, so it depends on the structure of the model. And the fact that the model has these Q factors, um, so you, you, you would like, uh, in the scale invariant uh, situation, you want your interaction to be scale invariant. And this, in, effect, in the effective action, you have that factor of G to the Qth power. Right? So being scale invariant means that this G to the Q has essentially to have dimension 1. Uh, so that would make the interaction scale invariant. And that's why, with more powers, you need the g to have lower dimension. Uh, so it depends on the details of this model. Uh, we one particular case we discussed in the beginning was uh, q equal to two, right? Um, that's when you we had something that looked like a mass term, and that gave us something like a one-dimensional fermion that has dimension one half. Uh, but that was a more free case, so. Now, I want to stress the, the simplicity. I, I did this uh, in detail just to show you how quickly you get the dimension. And you should contrast this to how much effort you need to find the dimensions, for example, in n equal to 4 superior males or in any other. In most theories, it takes you more than these, two, these steps that we have here. This is almost the simplest I've seen to determine the dimension. So it's very simple. And we could have determined it directly from the form of effective action uh, with the argument we were discussing after the question. Yes. Where did this scaling on top come from? This is a guess. Okay. So this, oh, oh, I forgot one step. Is that uh, so? After we are done with this, <laughs> we find how omega scales, how sigma scales with omega, right? And we check here, and we check that for small omega, we can indeed neglect this. So you can uh, check that this is indeed the case. So it's just a guess, and then should you make this guess, and then the guess works. Um, um, OK, so now you can also do the numerical calculation of solving the equations and find that uh, this guess uh, is correct. Uh, you can even calculate the coefficient here and find that it matches the numerical calculation. Um, now, in, in many physical systems, uh, many in theories in other dimensions, let's say in uh, 1 plus 1 dimensions or uh, 2 plus 1 dimensions, etc., uh, if we have scaling symmetry, we also have conformal symmetry, right? So normally scaling 
scaling implies conformal. And in two dimensions, it, we even have the full Virasor algebra. But, and that argument basically is saying that uh, scaling means that the trace of the energy momentum is zero. And uh, then um, this implies that we have extra symmetries. And in one, in, in one dimension, uh, this uh, implies this, the, tr the trace is just simply T itself, or the ha defective Hamiltonian, right? And um, this being zero means that uh, the system essentially would have uh, no dynamics. And, and not only would be invariant under uh, scalings, but under arbitrary reparameterization. So time goes to some function of time, OK? So this, this looks funny. So this fact that we would have no dynamics and this, and so it's a question of what happens. OK, so we, we explore what happens. So yes? Well, I don't know if a general theorem, but uh, already you find that it is somewhat funny. It would, it would mean that the Hamiltonian is effectively zero. So this uh, should raise some alarm, uh, right? Um, but w we'll see what happens. Um, um, I mean, there, there are some quantum mechanical systems that are scale invariant, so you can certainly have scale invariance and only probably only a to R invariant. So there are certainly th that's certainly a possibility. Now, um, so we we will exp we're just trying to explore what happens. Uh, well, in general, we could wonder whether we have this symmetry or not, and we will analyze in this model to see whether we do or do not have this symmetry, or in what sense we have the symmetry. So this lecture will be about this symmetry. The rest of the lecture. And uh, we'll see that it plays an important role. So this somehow, uh, we can ask this question. So this I was trying to phrase it as a question, not as a theorem or anything uh, like that. So simply uh, ask, do we have uh, do we have this symmetry or not? Um, yeah, we can have systems. I, I, I mentioned last time that there was this system of a particle in a potential 1 over x square and so on, which is conformal symmetry, and it's not invariant under this symmetry. So indeed, you can have such things. Um, but we just are, our goal is to understand what happened in this model. So this suggests that something might happen, and we'll try to understand it. Um, now, we look at, uh, so, um, so one observation is that if uh, we have, suppose G is a sub G of T1 and T2 is a solution of the equations of motion written over there. Uh, these are the equations of motion. This, uh, this one is here, the, this line and that line. And um, if we have such a solution, uh, the idea is that we'll, we'll define a reparameterized solution, which will be given by, so this is just the definition of what I mean by G sub F. Um, so it's given by the usual formula you would have if you did a scaling transformation with dimension delta f of t1 f of t2. Okay. Now it turns out that um, this transformation, so it's a transformation on g. We could also define it as a transformation on g tilde or on sigma tilde and, and so on. So on sigma we have the same thing. So by this uh, equation, so on sigma sigma has the dimension that is given by this, so dimension q minus 1 times delta. So we define a sig similar transformation for sigma. And then those transformations are a symmetry of these equations if we neglect, um, if we neglect uh, this term. So if we neglect this term, then uh, one can put the transformed values of sigma and g and check that this is a symmetry. Right? Um, and um, it's not 100% obvious, but it's uh, at least you can see here that, for example, in this integral over tau prime, if this has uh, dimension delta and this has dimension uh, delta times uh, q minus 1, right? And this has dimension delta. The total dimension here would be, uh, well, the total way this transforms is delta times the uh, delta times q, which is 1, and that's the factor of f prime we have, and this whole thing transforms that into an integral df, right? And that's the 
that will be of the form of the other equation, of the equation in the new variables. So that there you see that um, it could work, and you can as an exercise check that it does work. Uh, this is the symmetry of these equations. Um, similarly, we can even at the level of the action, we can check in this term that this is a symmetry of the action. I more or less mentioned that in response to a question. So if we have G tilde transforming in that way, then uh, we see that um, because we have this to the qth power, um, we had get here to f a factor of f prime at t1 and f prime at t2, and those combine to this to give an integral df, okay? df1, df2. And so the, this term in the action obviously has this symmetry, this term also, and this term turns out also has that symmetry if you, neg if you neglect uh, this dt, okay? Okay, so um, we have a whole reparametrization symmetry, so this symmetry is called reparametrization. Um, I mean, you could also call it uh, Virasoro, but we will not define an algebra, uh, so we are not going to call it Virasoro. We're going to just call it reparametrization. Yes? Um, um, yeah, no, but yeah, this is something to worry about. That's why uh, also, um, uh, that, that's why I also, well, first said this in the letter of the equations of motion, that they're invariant, so we'll generate new solutions. Here, uh, you would have to worry about the precise definition of this measure. Um, okay, so, um, Um, now the uh, um, yeah, I go to discussing the um, okay. So we'll discuss a little bit more later the implication, but some further implications of this. First, let me show you an application, rather a simple application, um, which is to. Um, which is we, we had found uh, g of t1 and t2, which is just a function of t1 minus t2 to the 2 delta. And a nice transformation we can do is uh, we can define f to be the hyperbolic tangent, no, without hyperbolic tangent, tangent of tau over beta. Um, so this is a transformation that maps uh, a circle to an infinite line. And by doing this transformation, we then get a g after doing this transformation, which is 1 over sine of uh, pi tau 1, 2 over beta. And then there are some factors of beta I'm not going to put, 2 delta. And this is, the, this is the correlation function now at finite temperature. It's periodic in beta. Um, and so we got the finite temperature solution from the uh, zero temperature solution. Um, Okay, so that's a simple application. So, and last time, so I would like to make a little bit contact with what I discussed like last time. So we had the g of t for finite temperature. So this is tau for the beta. And I was mentioning that uh, it had a shape uh, roughly like this. So this uh, 1 over sine is a shape that well diverges at the, uh, at the tau equal to 0, right? And the exact solution at the very large, so when beta j is much larger than 1, follows very closely this curve, except for very small values of tau. Okay. Um, okay, but what's important here is that it follows uh, this shape uh, almost everywhere. Um, okay. Now let's uh, go back now to the discussion of uh, this uh, reparametrizations. Oh, one more thing, one more thing. Um, from this finite temperature uh, thing, we, we can extract some. So we can see that the two-point function, for example, decays uh, for, we, we, this is a Euclidean time. We can now go to Lorentzian time. This is replaced by a sine hyperbolic. Um, and that then decays, uh, decays like delta times uh, two pi tau or beta. So it has some uh, ex some decay, and so this is, if you wish, some calculation of the quasi-normal modes of this system. So you excite the system, and then the 
expectation value decays uh, with this decay rate. Okay. You can also say that the system is thermalizing. So, uh, so we heat it, and then the, this does not oscillate. It just decays exponentially. Right? Yes. using different letters in the left and right hand side is a bad idea. Um, um, now this computation, this, um, this decay of the two-point function is valid when time or times over beta, which are much less than n, right? That's the condition we were discussing. It can, it cannot, this cannot be exact. So if the two-point function had, had decayed forever, then it would mean that we hit the system and then we lost we lost complete we lost complete memory of what happened right and this is inconsistent with unitarity and indeed uh, when t over beta gets a further n there is a correction to this and uh, this this uh, takes the form of a power law and th this involves quantum corrections i'm not discussing these are one over n effects um, and eventually at even exponentially big times uh, it should it should become more oscilla oscillatory with some very random oscillations and so on, but very small amplitudes. So people are uh, have be explored the property, the long time properties of this this type of correlators, uh, in order to try to understand how to make them compatible with unitarity and so on. Uh, but that goes beyond what I'm going to dis I'm discussing here. So we are at shorter times. Unfortunately, if we continue discussing that, we will run out of time. So long time behavior. So it's a joke. Very bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so we, we have, okay, let's go back to the discussion of the reparametrizations. So we have this uh, symmetry at low, low temperatures, uh, which is this reparametrization symmetry. Uh, or sometimes if we are at finite temperatures, we can call it the symmetry group diffeomorphisms of S1. Right? So we have the S1 circle of the Euclidean time, and we can reparametrize it. Um, and now, so these are, this is the symmetry of the action, or the symmetry of the equations. But the solution itself, which was that G over there, is not invariant under the symmetry, right? So the, the configuration that uh, we found to be the good approximation to the solution of the system is actually not invariant. Um, it is invariant under a small subgroup of these symmetries, which is the SL2R, right? So that is invariant under SL2R transformations that act uh, T goes to AT plus B over CT plus D, okay? So it's invariant under these transformations, but not under a general uh, diffeomorphism, right? So that means that this, uh, that this diffeomorphism uh, symmetry is uh, broken is spontaneously broken by the ch our uh, configuration, our choice of solution, to um, to SL2R, and so we have uh, some. So f, we should think of this f as a kind of Goldstone variable that lives in uh, the whole diffeomorphism group divided uh, divided by SL2. Okay. This this division really should be thought of as on the on the left because um, because this arriving symmetry is uh, is a symmetry where after you do some an arbitrary diffeomorphism you can always uh, then do this one and uh, not change the answer. Okay, very good. So that's uh, that's some variable and. Um, what that means, uh, let's see, I missed, uh, one. okay, um, so what that means is that um, when we put this, uh, when we try to evaluate the action, so if we are evaluating the functional integral, so the functional integral that is given in the, in the blackboard on the left, on that left blackboard, um, we have to do that functional integral. And, uh, and the fact that uh, all this, that, that so we can put this uh, solution and expand around that solution, 
And the problem is that we'll get uh, an infinity due to this, uh, these variables. So let me try to explain this uh, a little better. So we're doing a functional integral over the, so we have the sigma configuration and g tilde configuration. So these are just two directions in configuration space. It's, uh, it's of course, uh, functions of two var variables, so it's infinite dimensional. And the original solution g is some point here, right? And um, reparameterizations of this solution is, uh, is some slice of over this space, right? But on this slice, the action is uh, equal to what it was here. At least it's equal in the approximation that we neglected that dt uh, term. So in some approximation, um, the action is uh, equal along. So this was the original g, and this is the slice of gf. So this slice is parameterized by functions of one variable. This space is parameterized by functions of two variables. Okay. So it's, this is a lower dimensional space. And when we do the functional integral, we can, when we integrate in the directions orthogonal to this, we, we can integrate those out, but we are going to be left with the integral over, uh, over those uh, soft modes. And well, that, that would give us an infinity, so that looks uh, wrong. Um, and um, the, the way to deal with this uh, is that, um, is to remember that um, now, now why is it wrong that we get something infinite? I mean, the, the original SYK model had a finite dimensional Hilbert space, so the partition function should definitely give us something finite, right? So an infinity is definitely wrong. Okay. Um, we get an infinity both because the coefficients of f are non-compact and also because there are an infinite number of modes in f. Okay, so what we need to do is to, to remember that um, we really haven't gone to extremely lower. We we should need uh, we we need to take into account effects that break this symmetry, break the scaling symmetry. And so, what are those effects? Well, certainly we have that dt term in the action. We also have the fact that uh, the g is not exactly given by this formula. So the g at uh, very short difference of times, uh, the g will. Um, Will differ from the actual uh, g. The, the the g will differ from the naive conformal solution. It will be given by some other function. So when we uh, insert uh, when we insert um, the reparameterized g in the action, will uh, so remember the expression for g f was given by taking the conformal expression and then doing a reparameterization. So when we insert this into the action, because uh, the various terms in the action are not exactly given by the conformal g, and also because of the dt term, we'll get some action for this f. So we'll find that we'll have some action, that the original action, so we had some action of uh, g tilde and sigma tilde, and when we here replace these variables but g and sigma f, which are given by a formula like this, uh, we'll find some action for f. And this action will uh, be a generic functional of f. Um, it will have a factor of n because the overall action had a factor of n. Did I remember to put it? Yes, it's there. So there is a fa overall factor of n, and um, it's um, it, it will be suppressed in the uh, when j goes to infinity. So in the low energy limit, this we are expecting to be suppressed. And well, in principle, it can be anything complicated, but uh, we have to remember some things. So this action is coming from the vision where uh, g is di differing from uh, the conformal solution, and that happens when the two times are equal. So that is a functional, the functional, the action functional is a complicated functional, um, but uh, when the two times are different, the uh, function is well approximated by the conformal solution, and when the two times are similar, it's not so well approximated by the conformal solution. So we expect that this action, whatever it is, should be a local function of the... So this type of argument is suggesting that we should look for a functional which is a local function of this f. So some f to some power, let's say f prime to some power, f. so some Lagrangian which is a function of the function and its derivatives. Okay. So we have some integral of some Lagrangian which is a function of the function and its derivatives. So in making this step, I 
assume that um, the effects that break uh, this conformal symmetry come from short distance, right? So they come from short times. Good. So that's uh, assumption number one. Now, assumption number two is that we have to remember that uh, this SL2R symmetry was not doing anything. So this SL2R symmetry, so if we have a reparameterization of f, um, of g, so this gf, and then we do an SL2R transformation of this f, uh, we get exactly the same g. Okay. So we are not even moving along uh, along this curve when we do that. So we are at some point here and we do an sl transformation where exactly the same point. So it better be that uh, this Lagrangian gives us the same value for an f and an f that differs by an sl transformation. That means that this Lagrangian should be sl to invariant. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, in the end, so the, the, the first term that you can write down, so that rules out the uh, uh, bunch of terms here, and the first term with the lowest number of derivatives that uh, you can write down is uh, something called the Schwarzian derivative of f, so f t. Okay. Now, the Schwarzian derivative is equal to uh, f double prime over f prime, all prime minus one half f f double prime over f prime squared. Okay. So this with a minus sign. Uh, now this term has uh, some net number of derivatives, which is two, right? This prime cancels this prime, and there is an extra prime squared, right? So this th this is a two derivative term. So it has to have so there is an integral over time that cancels one of the derivatives. So this whole thing has units of energy. So this will have a one over j in front. Okay. So the, indeed uh, we see that when j goes to infinity, it goes to zero. We got recover the zero mode, but when j is finite we definitely have this extra term in the action. Okay. And then there is a numerical coefficient, maybe we call it alpha s, which uh, we have to work harder to compute. So this cannot be determined purely from symmetry arguments. We have to do a more complicated, well, we, we have to really understand uh, this, uh, the effective action and compute all the terms that break the symmetry to lead in order and compute this coefficient. And this can be done, it's not, yeah. Just for clarification, are you integrating over all or, or all orbit? Um, like I have a sigma and I pass control is not Yes. SL2R acts on that sigma. Yes, yes. yes. SL two R does not act on G and Sigma. So this is the uh, first first point. Uh, SL two R acts on F, right? Um, and this F acts on G, uh, act, acted on this G, and it moves us along this line. But if you are at some point on this line and you act with the sl 2 it just leaves the same point. It doesn't do anything on G. So it's like a gauge symmetry. It just does not move the, the point here. It just arose for, yeah. Let me say this more clearly. Uh, this this uh, manifold here uh, is um, the, the manifold spanned by the Goldstone boson. The Goldstone bosons are, uh, Diff S1 divided by SL2R. So when we act with SL2R, we don't move it. So let me give you, so suppose that, um, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is like in other situations where you uh, break a symmetry uh, to, to something smaller. You, uh, the part that leaves the configuration invariant uh, does not move you to, to a new point. So this this action is an action for the Goldstone particles, if you wish, or the Goldstone modes, um, and it's non-zero only for those for only for those f's that are really move you to somewhere else. For the f's that don't do anything, uh, this action gives zero. Right? For the particular transformations that don't do anything, this gives zero. We have to remember that that that's we are not really even integrating over that. Right? The original integral. So the original integral was an integral on this manifold. We are and we are re replacing that integral over that manifold by an integral over f. But it, 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 that would be incorrect because um, f, the integral over f would be the integral over the s one We have to remember that we are not integrating over SL2R transforms of f, or uh, SL2R transformations. Is that more or less clear? The whole manifold or the manifold? Just the whole plane? Yeah, by the whole manifold, I was referring the whole manifold of zero modes of uh, Goldstone. Yeah. 
Which one? Oh, the, the orthogonal? Or the SL2R. Yeah, the SL2R, yeah. We, we'll, we'll have to deal with that. So we'll throw them out. Yeah. So if we do the functional integral, we just don't integrate over those. But naively for it gave infinity for everything. No, no. The thing that gave us infinity was not that. What gave us infinity was the integral over the non-trivial f. The thing that is giving us infinity is the integral along these lines, well, this, this manifold. Okay. For, forget about the f, right? So the f is a theoretical construct that we are using to describe this, right? Uh, the original integral is, was over sigma tilde and g tilde. And here there was a valley where the action was zero in some approximation, was constant. And integrating along this valley uh, uh, gives us an infinity. Okay, so the integral is an integral over the g's and sigmas, g tildes and sigma tildes, along this valley, right? Now, what we are doing now is parameterizing this valley, okay? So, uh, there are different ways of parameterizing. We just choose to parameterize them in terms of this f. So, the f parameterization is not, um, well, there is a mathematical name for this. But, uh, as we vary over, over f, so, there, there are some f's that uh, leave us at the same point here. What is the proper name? The, it has a kernel, this um, um, this parameterization, in the sense that um, um, it's a redundant parameterization, where two different f's that look different give us actually the same point. And so we, we need to remember not to consider those as physically different. So when, when, when we think of f as the new physical variable, we need to identify f's that differ by SL2R. Is that true everywhere, or just on the Well, the um, we are only talking about the valley integral. So we first integrated over the normal directions, right? Uh, and now we reduce the full functional integral to an integral purely along the valley, right? So the integral got uh, split into two parts. First, the orthogonal directions. The orthogonal directions can be done more easily because that's a conformal invariant thing and so on. Um, and now we are only discussing the integral along the valley. Is that more clear now? No, in principle, there are further corrections, yeah. There, there's no, no, no one computed them as far as I know, but yeah, th you can have further corrections. Uh, yeah. um. Oh, yes, that's right. So Kitayev computed, let me remember. Um, yeah, he computed an additional correction. It's not published, so I won't refer to it. Uh, so he computed an additional correction that uh, goes like 1 over j squared. And um, and then there are, there are also some other corrections that go like fractional powers of j that have to do with other inversions of other operators and so on. Um, um, derivative. Yes. Well, well, the the the, the higher derivatives go together with the one over j. Right? That's just dimensional analysis. Um, all I was referring to is the fact that there could be fractional powers of J corresponding to more non-trivial operators that you can have here. Uh, now, fractional power just means that you're inserting an operator which acts on the on the uh, these normal directions that we are not discussing. Uh, that we need need to remember that also that part is not exactly conformal invariant. Uh, let me not discuss this. It's uh, uh, it's not important for what I'll discuss. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All the all these terms should vanish. So this one, the one that Kitai computed, all those terms should uh, vanish. Uh, um, what is there? Oh, I don't remember. It's a. Uh, it uh, it had the form roughly of uh, something like one. It was an integral over two times, and uh, it had maybe an f to the fourth, or and then some uh, logarithms of uh, f minus f prime, f minus uh, f by f prime. I mean f of u and f of u prime. Uh, so something roughly like this, um, uh, and an integral over two times the u the u prime. So. No. 
No. Um, well, this, this other term is taking into account some uh, non-local effects, which come from the fact that we still have all, I mean, the, the whole theory um, has other low energy modes, right? All these conformal modes that are conformal invariant, right? And uh, it's through the interaction with those conformal invariant terms that you get uh, these non-local non -local terms in the action. Yes. No, F, well, here we're doing a Euclidean computation. So, uh, but uh, yes, F is uh, some kind of dynamical variable that uh, characterizes some of the degrees. I, I, I will make it more clear in the next lecture probably, but uh, yes. Yes. Yes, yes. No, no, but like we, 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 we in principle have to find the measure for f, right? So we had some measure for sigma and g, and uh, now we have to find the correct measure for integrating on this valley, right? And uh, it, it's some work that you need to do to find the measure. This work has been done, was done by Douglas and Witten, by Douglas Stanford and Ed Witten, and they uh, computed uh, the correct measure. And and th this measure, th this measure also was guessed by some other people, um, Kamanev and uh, other two other authors. I remember, I'm forgetting right now. And uh, the measure is uh, roughly the integral df, uh, so df over f prime essentially. So that's uh, the measure. Um, so, <coughs> so that's uh, so you can pr principally determine. This is some work to determine the measure. You it can be done. It was done. And not only that, but you can even uh, do the whole path integral <coughs> of the Schwarzian action. And uh, there, the, the Schwarzian action has some symmetries, and, and due to that, you can actually exactly do this uh, path integral. Um, uh, so th that that would include so doing okay this doing the path integral over the Schwarzian action. L let me just be a little more clear. So for example, you can calculate the partition function. Well, let me do it. Let me discuss a calculation for which uh, this uh, doing the path integral is relevant. OK, so, um, so imagine we want to compute the partition function. So the, the path integral that is uh, written over there is computing the partition function for us. Um, and one approximation to the partition function is just to evaluate uh, the action on this uh, conformal solution. Right? So we can take that uh, solution and we put it into the action. So that's the leading term. So we take a, n and then we evaluate the classical action, so that action over there, uh, on the conformal solution. Okay? So let's evaluate just one term just to see uh, what type of thing we get. So we got this uh, sign for so for finite temperature we got this sign to the to delta and we'll evaluate it in the last term of the action so we'll evaluate uh, the g to the q right so that's an integral of the form uh, so it's a factor of beta from the integral of one of the times and the integral of the other time gives us sine of uh, tau or beta to the power to delta to the, and all to the q but delta times q is one so it's squared okay so this integral actually diverges at small tau. Okay. okay, that's a little little bit of a problem. Again, that's some diversion. But we have to remember that this form of the equation was not valid for very small tau because uh, it gets modified a little bit at tau so for the one over j. And so the diversion part uh, has the form of beta times uh, j. Okay. So j is like a UV cutoff. So let's say we integrate that to tau, which is ep epsilon. Epsilon is 1 over j, and, uh, and so this integral goes like beta times j, and then there will be some, there could be a finite piece, and so on. Right? 
So a partition function has a form which has uh, beta times j times some number. And there are other terms, there are also other terms that are diversion. So in the end, you get something like this. But because it's linear in beta, so the divergences are local in time, and so the answer is linear in beta. And so we get uh, something that has, can be interpreted as the contribution to the ground state energy. So when we discuss the eigenvalue distribution, we notice that it has a minimum at the, so if you look at the eigenvalue distribution, it had some minimum. But it had some minimum here, and so uh, j times this number is this minimum energy, right? Or maybe with a minus sign. Uh, and then there will be a constant piece here. Uh, let me call that S0. So that's just some constant independent of, uh, independent of beta and j and so on. And then there could be uh, some other term. So there would be, um, okay, so th this just came from evaluating this in the action, right? Then there was this uh, this subtlety that uh, that we couldn't evaluate it directly. So this was evaluated directly in the conformal action, and then there was a subtlety that we couldn't use exactly the conformal action. We had to add the Schwarzian term. So we can ever put this uh, function f, which is tangent of tau or beta, were there. We put it in this Schwarzian action, and that gives us a further contribution of the form alpha s over beta j, maybe with some factors of two and so on. Um, OK, so that's uh, what we got uh, from the classical action. There could be some further 1 over j terms here. OK, so further term. So this is the whole action to order n. And we could, this is, in principle, some general function of beta j. And we could even compute it numerically by solving the, the equations of motion numerically and putting them back into the, the action without making the lower energy approximation. We would get here some uh, general, so some function of beta j. That's the classical approximation. Okay. Then uh, there are, um, well, let me see what more things. Let me just mention a few things about the classical approximation, and then we'll discuss some further things. There is a peculiarity, which is this constant piece. So this constant piece um, can be interpreted, well, it's normally called the ground state entropy. Um, it's, uh, it's an entropy. So it's, this is in the free energy. It has the contribution of an entropy. So we calculated the entropy from this, from this uh, free energy. We would get uh, S0 as the entropy. And one might be a little confused by the fact that uh, we have some entropy, because here, I mean, we have some eigenvalue distribution which uh, goes to zero. How is it that uh, we're getting an entropy? But the, the point here is that uh, we should think of this eigenvalue distribution. I mean, it could, it's, uh, it's some big number, because we have a huge number of states uh, of the form e to the s0 times n, so for the exponentially big number. So s0 is independent of n, so we have n s0. And then here, the idea is that we have some smooth function of energy. So for example, uh, we could have something like uh, well, what some smooth function of energy minus e0, right? e0 for energy less than e0, and it's non-zero for energy bigger than e0. And if we were to integrate this over energies, yeah, as long as this gives an order one contribution, right? it is perfectly fine. It would be considered part of these order one contributions we get here. Okay. Uh, but the classical piece, the piece that goes like n, comes from this big prefactor in the density of state. Right. Um, OK, so that's uh, where the ground state entropy means it is. So let me, let me emphasize this again. So having this ground state entropy, does not imply that we'll have a peak here in the density of states that we have a delta function. Right? Um, having this ground state entropy is perfectly consistent with having a density of states which actually goes to zero there. Um, it's a property not of the lowest energy state, but it's a property of, a, of some energies which are quite bigger than the energy spacing, and it's a collective property of all those. Okay. Is that? Uh, here is some pre overall prefactor, which is more or less constant. Um, good. Then we have this thing. This uh, this is the uh, we can call it the near extremal entropy, near extremal, or the lower low temperature, the, the part that is temperature dependent and is linear in the temperature. Okay. Now, as, as we will see, this is also a property of uh, of near extremal black holes. They always have 
temperature the, the, the temperature dependent part is always linear in the temperature and in principle it could have been any power I mean if, if you just demand if you just think about dimensional analysis this could have been any power could be beta j to any correction right? so if the leading correction to the conformal limit was given by some operator dimension uh, delta prime so we could get some power here that depends on delta prime but because of the pattern of symmetry breaking that we have here the Schwarzian discussion and blah 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 uh, implies that uh, this power is, is what it is right so this power is a signature of having this extra reparameterization mode okay. it's a consequence of having this extra reparameterization mode um, it's a simple consequence um, okay so that's uh, classical so then you can ask about uh, uh, quantum corrections F yeah, so um, in, or, in order to get this factor, for example, you need actually a piece that goes like e to the, um, let me remember, n, and then there is a square root of something like e minus e0, perhaps divided by e0, some factor roughly like this. Uh, so it's a factor like this in the, uh, in the density of state here. So, um, but uh, yeah, so at energy is close to e0, this factor is not important. And, uh, and then there are some other factors I'm going to mention in a second. Um, yeah. Yes, 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 um, yes. Okay, so now one more comment about, uh, yeah, I think uh, I'm right of thing. Yeah. I'm out of the nominal time, so let me go just a little bit out of the nominal time, just to finish the, this idea. Um, so now we have the uh, path integral, right? So we do the path integral over the orthogonal directions. So the path integral over the orthogonal directions is going to be give a result which is to lead in order scale invariant, okay? And will be another constant, so let me call it uh, S0 prime, okay? So this is some correction to, the, to, to this entropy and it's not uh, too important, okay? And there will be also one of n corrections to this energy and so on from the diversions. Um, and then, it w then we'll have to do the path integral over the Schwarzian mode, right? But in that path integral, we are going to we are just doing it perturbatively. So we are going to expand around the solution. We are going to expand around the solution. So we are going to parameterize f as uh, tau plus epsilon of tau, okay? And expand in epsilon. So that uh, will end up being an integral over d epsilon of e to the, so we have n over j, and then we have this integral d tau, and then let me, go, ma let me call tau as a variable that goes from 0 to 1. So we get epsilon double prime square minus epsilon prime square. Okay. So we are supposed to do this path integral. Okay. Um, this, I'm, I'm just pointing this out in detail to see that uh, this integral has some zero mode. So if an epsilon that is constant uh, gives us an infinity, an epsilon which is an epsilon which is uh, like uh, e to the i time also will give us a divergence. Okay. So there are actually three zero modes, uh, and these are, but these are the two SL two R zero modes. So we are not integrating over this. So this is an integral. So we can integrate over all modes epsilon n. So we expand epsilon. Fourier series, e to the i n tau, um, and we integrate here over n's uh, which are bigger, strictly bigger than one, and then we do we, we, with this action. Okay. So those uh, th there are no diversions because these are some like gauge modes. We are just supposed to divide by the volume of SL2R, and we get something. Uh, we get something, and um, this uh, this whole integral um, can be. Uh, Analyzed by saying, well, um, here these factors of beta and j can be absorbed in uh, epsilon, and so we get something that is formally independent of beta j, but due to this uh, extraction of the zero modes, we get uh, one over beta j, uh, one over beta j to the uh, to the three halves, one one half for each zero mode. Well, I, this argument went too fast, but I'm running out of time. So the the answer is this exponential times uh, 1 over beta j to the one half, 3 halves. 
And it turns out that uh, the Schwarzian action is such that you can do the integral exactly, and the integral exactly uh, of just the Schwarzian piece is uh, indeed given by this, uh, these two factors. Okay. That's the exact answer to all orders in n, uh, including the Schwarzian, the low energy expansion of this model to all orders in the 1 over n expansion. Thank you. Question? Was there a login? No login, correction. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I I'm, I'm have some interface. It's near zero entropy, so low energy. Call it near extremal because it applies to near extremal black holes.